Good morning. Sure glad that you've chosen this morning to join us for this online worship experience here at Community Reformed Church. Hope that this past week you've experienced just all sorts of ways in which God's been at work in the midst of all that's taking place in our lives. And what a privilege it is for us to gather, even though it's in this unique online way, for us to remember him together. So especially want to welcome those of you who may be new to this experience or to Community Reform Church. Certainly glad that you're here. If there's any way that we can be helpful in helping you get a better sense of who we are or connecting with you, we'd love to have the chance to do it. A couple quick announcements before we enter into worship today. First is just a reminder, we're on this schedule of 9 a.m. online services um, each Sunday morning, and then we have an outside worship experience at 10 a.m. here at Community Reform Church. So that will continue. We, we have been in the process of working on kind of the plans moving into the fall. We hope to be able to give those to you here shortly, but just encourage you to continue to pray, not only for us, but for all the organizations, especially things like the school, who are in the process of making those important decisions. In addition to that, I uh, just want to remind you that next week we will be celebrating communion. So online, you'll need to bring your own elements into your space. And if you're coming for the outside worship, we encourage you to bring your elements from home as well. If for some reason you forget, we will have elements here, but encourage you to remember that for next week. And next week, we're going to be focusing on the story of the healing of the blind man. It's going to be out of Matthew chapter 10. So if you want to read ahead, that's going to be what's taking place next week. Well, what a gift it is that we have this opportunity to remember and to be open to the ways that God speaks. We recognize that putting our faith in God isn't just about believing things that have taken place in the past, but continuing to invite God to refine who we are and how we live in the world that we live in today. So may this time together encourage all of us, inspire courage in all of us to live more faithfully for him. Let's pray together as we worship together. God, we give you thanks for the gift that you are. We're reminded of the incredible story that your scriptures tell, of your love expressed over time in so many different ways, in your pursuit of us, even the brokenness within us, even pursuing us when we were running from you. Father, we give you thanks for your faithfulness. And Father, help us to bring all of ourselves into this experience today. And in that, Father, help us to hear you speak. Help it to change our minds and hearts to line up more with yours. And help us, Father, to live more deeply by faith as we allow you to be the Lord and King and leader of our lives. So thank you for the gift of Jesus. And we recognize in this moment he is worthy of our worship, not just a Sunday morning gathering, 
but a, give, a commitment to all of our lives being lived for him. So may we worship together. Spirit lead us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I'm so glad that you could join us. We are going to worship the Lord this morning together. We serve such a good God, a great God. We are going to sing about his goodness this morning. You are good, you are good, oh, you are good. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, in my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good. Thank you. 
together as we step into God's Word. Father, not only do we celebrate in the gift of those words and the reminder of those truths, but we pray that it would be true for us. That is, we're reminded in the singing, as we're reminded as we step into your Word, of the truth of who you are and the truth of who we are because of you. Help us to experience that peace we just sang about. Help us to grow in our trust in you as we face all the different circumstances that come in our life, but especially in the midst of this time, that a time seems so uncertain, that's filled with all sorts of polarizations and differences of opinions, in which there's lots of heaviness in regards to thinking about what the future holds and the wonderings about what it's going to mean for people we deeply love. 
Father, we pray that we would be drawn to you. That even though a lot of questions are, remain unanswered, and we're not sure what tomorrow is going to bring, may it be well with our souls. Because we know you sit on the throne. And because we know that you will be with us each step of the way. So Spirit, may this word, may this time in your word, may it affirm that truth. And may it remind us that we are a people who need you. Not just on Sunday mornings, but throughout all of our lives. So Spirit, lead us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. So as many of you are aware, we've been working through kind of some of the more well-known stories in the midst of the Old and the New Testaments. And so we've titled this series that we've been in all summer, Story Time. We've just been stepping into each of the stories and really looking at what, is these, what does this story mean in the bigger picture of what God's seeking to express to us, and especially what is this story, how does this story help us to see the gift and the significance of Jesus Christ? And so we've been in the Old Testament, we've been focusing now here recently in the New Testament. Um, we're going to be talking about the story of um, Peter walking on water, being invited by Jesus to come and do that. But before we get there, I want to lead us into this conversation with a couple questions. First is, what is this definition, what word does this definition define? What does this definition define? What word? A state of physical ease or freedom from pain or constraint. A state of physical ease or freedom from pain or constraint. I know I can hear you calling them out from home. This is the definition of comfort. Most of us, maybe all of us, Enjoy comfort, where we're not struggling physically, our tummies are full, we're not experiencing pain, we're covered from any of the elements, we're not too hot, we're not too cold, there's not a lot of difficult things in the midst of our life, we're not limited, we're not being told what we can and can't do, there's freedom, comfort. And let's be honest, it's actually one of the gods that at times that we worship. In fact, it's a God that has a lot of power, I think, in my life. Maybe yours too. Who doesn't want to be comfortable? Who doesn't want to have that be part of our experience? Yet as we're going to be reminded of today, that if we let the God of comfort be more important than our Jesus, then that's going to limit significantly what we do and not do. I came across this slide that I thought was really helpful. It's hard to grow your faith inside of your comfort zone. And my guess is you understand that. My guess is you know that. And so much of that knowing is through your own experience. That if you live inside your comfort zone, if you live in that place where it's easy, you're avoiding pain, there's, there's very little constraint. There's very little sacrifice. You're probably not growing. And more than likely, we could all tell stories of walking through some of the challenges that we faced, whether it's confronting our own sin, whether it's navigating a difficult circumstance, that it's in the midst of those difficult times where we've lost some of that comfort, that there's often the most opportunity for us to grow. And this story in Matthew 14 really illustrates this in some significant ways. It's a very familiar story. And there's all sorts of sermons, all sorts of messages that come out of this story that hold some foundational truth about the challenge of when we let comfort be kind of our God, what that then leads to. And the requirement of our faith to be people of courage. 
people who are willing to sacrifice the God of comfort at the altar of following Jesus Christ. So let's step into the story. And there's some really key things that come out of this story that I think are helpful for us as we continue down our journey of following Jesus Christ. So the title of this message is Walking on Water, which is just mind-boggling to try to imagine in the midst of a storm, there's Jesus on the water. And in this picture, there's Peter being willing to come to him on the water. So we'll be in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. And what's interesting about the Gospel of Matthew when it comes to this story is this story really comes right on the heels of where we ended last week, the story of the feeding of the 5,000. And one of the things you'll note in this story is how often the word immediately is found in this text. So keep a lookout for that as we walk through this text together. So this is Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, beginning in verse... 22, if you want to look at it in your own Bible. Verse 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And again, in the Gospel of Matthew, we find this on the heels of the feeding of the 5,000. So you can imagine that concluded with, and then there were 12 baskets left over. And all these crowds have just been fed, not only from the five loaves and the two fish, but they've been fed by the word of Jesus. And so there's all these people here. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. So he sent them off on a boat. Verse 23, after he had dismissed the crowds, Jesus went up the mountain by himself to pray. And that's an important part of this text. And it's an important part of in some ways, how I'm going to conclude this message today. That even Jesus, in the midst of all of this ministering, all of this serving, all of this proclaiming, all of this incredible uh, miracle that's taken place with the feeding of the 5,000, that Jesus needs space himself. That he needs to be reminded and rejuvenated and get a break from all that's taking place. And so he goes off by himself. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. So, you know, for many of us who've heard this story over and over and over again, we don't think a whole lot about it. We just nod our heads and go, yeah, Jesus just walked on the water out to the sea to the boat. But imagine what that was like. Imagine the experience of being a disciple in the boat and seeing this figure walking on the water, seeing this figure coming to them in the midst of the storm probably already experiencing a whole bunch of fear because they were feeling out of control with the weather and the uncertainty of their future. And here this figure comes to them. No wonder why. No wonder they're afraid. And they believe it's a ghost. Verse 27, but immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, take heart. It is I. Do not be afraid. So they began to recognize that it was Jesus. And, you know, one of the simple principles that comes out of this text that we're going to press into in a few moments is this idea that where Jesus is, there is no need for fear. Or that in the midst of the fear, that as we turn our attention more upon him, that more and more we experience less and less fear. And more and more of what we just sang about that even in the midst of a storm, it is well with our souls. But that's not where the story ends, with Jesus saying, hey, here I am, it's all going to be okay. But Peter sees Jesus out on the water, and he answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. I 
Right? This says a lot about Peter. And on the one hand, you probably go, he's a fool. What is he doing? He's stepping out of a good old, good solid boat that can float. And he's stepping out onto water. Peter, what are you thinking? But on the other hand, what we see here in Peter is something that I think is so reflective of one who trusts. And trusts in this moment pretty completely. That if Jesus is out there in the water and he's invited me to come to him, that even though in my rational human mind it's impossible for me to walk on water, I no longer see it as impossible because I'm looking at Jesus. So he gets out of the boat. Verse 30, But when Peter noticed the strong wind, he became frightened. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. I mean, imagine that. Imagine being present for the, those moments. Imagine being one of the disciples sitting in the boat watching this all take place with Peter. And then as soon as Peter calls out to Jesus and Jesus grabs a hold of him, the storm ceases. The waves calm down. Verse 33 and those in the boat worshiped Jesus, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Truly, you are the Son of God. So there's lots of different key things we could take out of this text that are important for us in regards to what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? How does this story illustrate some of those foundational principles of following Jesus? Well, the first one ties directly to the message from last week and the feeding of the 5,000 the 5, or the 15 or 20,000 if you include women and children. Remember that little ditty? Give what you got and God will make it a lot. So in this story, Peter illustrates this foundational truth that Peter can walk, but with Jesus, Peter can walk on water. I mean, you and I can live our lives we can have some experiences. We can be in charge of our life. We can, in some sense, just survive. But what Jesus and the Bible makes so crystal clear is we won't walk on water. We will live out of our humanness. And sadly, so often that means living out of our brokenness and our woundedness and our sinfulness. Again, God doesn't force us to follow him. But Peter's story here so clearly illustrates that when we seek to follow him, he will do abundantly more through our lives than we could ever do on our own. He will do miracles in us and through us. In some ways, that's very convicting for me. Think about how often I settle just to be able to walk. Because in trusting in myself or my power or my control, I can walk, but I'll never walk on water. I can be a dad, but I'll never be the dad that John and Anna, in whom they'll see Jesus. Be a husband, but I'll never be the husband that expresses love like Jesus loves the church. I can be a friend, but never a friend that can have the impact or be the blessing that helps my friends see and experience the love and grace of Jesus. There's no way Peter can walk on water without Jesus. And there's no way that our lives 
can help usher in God's kingdom and help ex- people experience him unless our attention is upon Jesus. One of the other pieces that comes out of this story for me is that fear keeps us in the boat, not faith in Jesus. All right, so the focus of the story quickly moves to Peter and Jesus and their interactions, but there's still a group of folks sitting in the boat, watching from the boat. And even though they're experiencing a bunch of fear in the midst of the storm, there's some level of safety in the midst of that boat. There's some level of comfort in staying in the boat. Just think at times how fear leads us to stay in the boat. For many of us, this whole COVID experience, and even some of what we see taking place within the realm of politics, and even race, there's a lot of fear. And from the comfort of the boat, we're often doing things and saying things that aren't all that helpful, and that aren't all that helpful in pointing people to Christ, and aren't all that helpful to us turning our attention upon him in the midst of this time. It's easy in the midst of that fear and that reactiveness to let those emotions and those insecurities drive our behaviors. How's that working for you? How's that impacting the relationships around you? How is that helping you to testify to your faith if you're huddled in the corner of the boat, letting fear be what drives you? Fear keeps us in the boat. Faith in Jesus is what leads Peter to take a step out of it. Another piece that really surfaces in the midst of this text is when we focus off of Jesus, we sink. I mean, I could spend lots of time telling you stories of how that's true in my own life. You know, and recently through the initial stages of COVID, those first few weeks and months, it was really easy for me to focus on comfort, not Jesus. I felt out of control, right? We, I felt some level of fear. All of a sudden, all these things were taken away. All of a sudden, we started looking at each other as threats, looking at mail as threats, not having a chance to connect in the ways that we wanted to connect. And how easily in the midst of that, my eyes moved away from focusing on Christ and instead focused on my circumstances and the fear and the uncertainty that was a part of it. And we sink. We grab a hold of other gods. And one of those that often, at least for me, maybe for you too, became so important in the midst of all of that uncertainty was the God of comfort. But that's still sinking. It's not providing for me and for us what we really need in the midst of the storm that has come in our lives and in this world. I encourage you to take a moment and just see how that truth has been expressed in your own life. How maybe that's impacted some of the relationships that are important to you. Because when we focus off of Jesus, we become pretty selfish people. When we focus off of Jesus, the world gets really small and becomes all about us. And when we allow that to take place in our lives, we almost always hurt the people around us. We almost always separate from the most important relationships. We come, become very clear about who's to blame and who's in the wrong. When we focus off of Jesus, it's everybody else's fault. And we have a hard time taking responsibility for what's going on in our life. When we focus off of Jesus, we sink. But when we focus on Jesus, we are not driven by fear. 
It's so important, isn't it, that we are consistently reminded of what really is true. And that's not just a Sunday morning, once a week thing. We need this far more than once a week. That's why it's so important that whether it's in the morning or evening or during the day or throughout the day, that we keep turning our attention upon him. And we see this even in Jesus in the way that he lived his life, that he recognized his need to be still, to be quiet, to turn his attention toward his father, to remember what's true in the midst of all of the need and all of this uncertainty and all of the things that were potentially going to happen that would be at Jesus' expense. It's like we need to consistently recalibrate, reorient ourselves to the truth of who God is and his presence in our life and who we are because of him, that we need to keep coming back to that so that we're seeing clearly and we're not driven by the fear that so clearly clouds us from remembering what really is true. Because when we focus on Jesus, we find peace. When we focus on Jesus, we experience love. And as 1 John says so clearly, perfect love casts out fear. You know, I think some of the work for all of us is the work of confession when we fall short, when we choose to focus on our own control or the God of comfort, that part of the ongoing work for us and part of what happens when we take the, make the space and take the time to remember what really is true, conviction of our own sin, conviction of our other gods comes to the surface. And again, Jesus Christ did not die on the cross so that you and I could live in shame. He died on the cross so that you and I could experience his grace and the freedom that that offers. But part of the journey of our faith is continuing to come back to that place of confession and repentance. That we acknowledge we're cowering in the corner of the boat. We're not living by our faith. And we confess that and we ask for God's forgiveness and we ask for God's strength and courage. And we do that moment by moment throughout our day as we seek to be people like Peter who keeps stepping out of that boat. Because what leads him out of the boat is not fear, but faith in the one who he has his eyes focused upon. Another important piece that comes out in this story is that our faith is revealed and refined in the midst of the storms. Right? If we cower in the boat, it says something about what we put our faith in. If we're stepping out of the boat, even in the midst of the storm, with our eyes upon Jesus, it says that we have put our faith in him. The action of our life, the practice of our life, testifies to in whom we've put our faith. And can you only imagine having the chance to have a conversation with Peter when this is all said and done? Peter, what was it like to walk on water? What was it like to experience trusting in and seeing the power of God at work in your life? That is refining Peter's faith. That's helping him to be able to testify to the story of God's faithfulness in his life. I trusted in Jesus. I walked on water. I've been really convicted the last few months of just some of the places where my faith is being revealed and it's not in Christ. And God's been kind of knocking at the door continuing to ask me to put my faith completely in him, in this area where I've been pulling back, in this area where I've been holding back. 
And I'm beginning to see so clearly the impact of letting faith in something other than Jesus be what guides and direct your life. And I'm beginning to do the work with help, and we're going to get to that help in a moment, of really turning my attention upon him and taking the steps out of the boat that are at the core of what it means to follow Jesus. Because the life with Jesus is never a life where comfort is our primary value. And then this final piece that really surfaces in the midst of this important story is that true faith, faith in Jesus, keeps asking for help. Right? The story doesn't end with Peter stepping out of the boat and then just strutting around on the water. That he, like us, is so easily distracted by the storms that is taking place around us. And he begins to sink. But he calls out to Jesus, Lord, save me. And it's part of the journey, isn't it, of following Jesus, is that we are a people that continue to ask for help. One of the primary ways we do that in the context of our life is through prayer. Prayer isn't just about asking from God what you want. Prayer is about asking from God what you need. And more than anything else, what we need is to experience him, to put our trust in him, to believe in him, to live a life in obedience to him. He is the source of our power. And so we need to keep asking him for the wisdom, the strength, the courage, the direction that we need as we seek to keep stepping out of the boat and walking through not only the storms, but even the calm that comes in our life at times. And let's remember that so often the practice of asking Jesus for help means that we are asking one another for help. So often the way that we experience the wisdom, the counsel, the guidance, the direction, the encouragement, the support that we need is through the brothers and sisters in Christ that we invite to be part of the journey that we're on. Whether you are a 10-year-old, a 20-year-old, a 40-year-old, an 80-year-old, you need his help. And you need the help of other followers of Jesus Christ. That we are not meant to go this road alone. But sadly, one of the great challenges we face in the world of the church today, especially in North America, is how often people like you and people like me go it alone. We don't ask for help. We're more concerned about how that's going to be perceived than we are of actually being faithful to the following of Jesus and trusting him and the help that he'll provide, not only in our one-on-ones with Jesus, but in the way that he continues to bring his love and his grace and his support and his direction through people in our life. So whether you're a 10-year-old kind of figuring out what it means to be a friend to other friends, what it means to love your parents, you need help. Whether it's a 20-year-old trying to figure out what's next for you, whether it's work or college, whether it's a relationship, you need help. Whether it's a 40-year-old who's kind of in the midst of maybe some career changes or facing some financial challenges or just some sense of insecurity or challenge of sin that's taking place in your life, you need help. Whether it's an 80-year-old thinking maybe about end-of-life type of things or looking back to what's taking place in your life and maybe in the midst of that there's some regret, you need help. That if we're going to be people like Peter who keep stepping out of the boat 
and living by faith, we need to keep asking for help. This following of Jesus is not to be done on our own. And we sure hope the church together, we as community reformed church and the greater church, can testify to our need for Jesus by our willingness to express that need to each other and to him. One of my favorite quotes, and I'm pretty sure, not 100% sure, I did some research to try to confirm it, but I couldn't. One of my favorite quotes is this one. That courage is not the absence of fear, but the presence of love. There's lots of quotes that start with courage is not the absence of fear. But I think it's Frederick Buechner who said, but the presence of love. So taking that step out of the boat wasn't that there was no fear in Peter. He just wasn't focused on it. And the more that you and I can turn our attention upon Christ and that through the community and fellowship of brothers and sisters in Christ that we all can encourage one another to turn our attention upon him, to let he be the one that we put our faith in, the one that we focus our attention upon. It's not that there isn't going to be challenges when God asks us to speak or asks us to serve. It's not that there's going to be some, no discomfort or no fear in the midst of those challenges. But to live as Jesus calls us to live out of the courage of our dependence upon him and out of the knowledge of who we are because of him and out of the trust that we have in his spirit in the midst of all that's taking place in our life, that we can be courageous because we live in the presence of God's love. We know who we are. We know who he is. We know what he offers to us. We know where he is. So we can live out of our dependence upon him. And the God who created everything out of nothing, the God who raised Lazarus and Jesus from the dead, the God who can do all that there is that can be done, is with us. So as we put that into practice more and more, we don't have to live by fear, but by faith in him. May God help us as we seek to focus our attention upon him, to keep stepping out of that boat, and to keep practicing our faith. And may we do that together. May one of the practical things that takes place this week is in those areas of your life where you're feeling that storm, in those areas in your life where you're cowering in the corner of the boat, in those areas of your life where fear is driving you, may you ask him for help. And may we this week not only ask Jesus for help, but may we let somebody else in and ask them to help us as well. Just imagine the impact if each of us put that into practice because it's the foundation by which we then step in faith day after day. Let's pray together. God, we're so so thankful for the gift of this word, for this story, and for the way that it illustrates what it means to follow you. Again, Father, in those places where we've been cowering in the corner of the boat, driven by fear, not depending upon you, may we confess. But may we also like Peter, turn our attention upon you and continue to do so. And may we live by faith. May we serve sacrificially. May we love unconditionally. May we encourage and build up the people that are around us. May we testify in word and in deed that you are our Lord and Savior. That the most important news for anyone to hear is the news of Jesus Christ and his love. So help us to live by faith and not fear, we pray.
in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So now as we go about this week, may we put that into practice. Again, not doing it alone, but trusting in him and one another. Go in grace. Go in love. Go knowing that you are not alone, that Jesus is with you every step of the way. Go in peace. Amen. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord turn his face toward you and